and available to everyone. But is it? You talk about uh, free medicine, but we have an impression that medicine really isn't free. And if you want really good care, really special health care, that you have to give your doctor a little extra, the nurse a little extra, so that people in, in some way do end up paying. Is that true? Patients don't pay nothing for treatment. Nothing. We were told, however, that giving gifts like roses and extra money to doctors, in effect bribes, is common. One Georgian told us that after her first baby, her husband slipped the doctor $240. One reason for the extra money on the side and a reason Soviet health care is inadequate is that doctors have been paid less than engineers and other well-educated professionals. Well, I wouldn't mind if the salary was more. <laughs> Gorbachev is giving doctors raises and he's trying to decentralize. Under his new plan, there'll be more decision making by the hospitals and doctors will get bonuses, merit pay for good work. A distinct move away from pure socialized medicine. The problems with Soviet health care are a metaphor for the system in general. Inefficient, overly centralized, and authoritarian. We asked one doctor if he thought Gorbachev's restructuring, his health care perestroika, would solve the problems. He said the plan was like a newborn baby. Valerie. Valerie. Mm -hmm. Like Valerie. It's too early to say if he'll turn out to be a hero or a hooligan. And to your great crew, to your great people who do all this, to you, to you. It's party time at the Grotich's place. And nowadays, the party line is Glasnost. Openness. That's Vitaly Karadzic, editor of the weekly magazine Ogenov, Little Flame. And talk about Glasnost, that's best-selling British spy novelist John Le Carre, who has made a career of the Cold War. The conversation is not just daring. Tour reporter returning to Moscow after more than 10 years, it seems downright dangerous. The difference between intelligence collecting, which must be a good thing to do, and the secret police, which must be a bad thing to have. And I think Vitaly and I meet very well on that front. And you think maybe secret police now have another microphone in this one. It's looking about us all the time. Changes. FBI, CIA, KGB, your I don't know what name with number. We must uh, tell them, please, people, work, but work for us. You must know that not you above us, me, but you. Criticizing the KGB on camera may seem risky, but Vitaly Karadzic takes chances the way most editors take lunch every day. You see only future editorials. When Karadzic was brought in just one year ago, Ogunyak was a downright boring Illustrated Weekly. Now it's controversial, out on the cutting edge of Mikhail Gorbachev's campaign for Glasnost. Karadzic has reportedly angered some Soviet officials who believe running the country means never having to say you're sorry. We publish a lot now. You've done stories on police corruption. You've done candid reports of what's wrong with Soviet society. You've published the writings of previously banned authors such as Boris Pasternak. What, are you crazy or what? <laughs> Maybe, but you see, sometimes I feel that you change uh, norms too because it's normal life you know it's quite normal life to publish pasternak to publish about corruption to catch somebody if he is uh, cry he commit crime you see we must be honest and open but still there's the question of why do it there's there are many elements in your own society that says listen you must not criticize soviet society because to criticize it as much as you do you're going to destroy it yes but I think that uh, society which will be destroyed from normal critic, it's uh, something wrong with this society. I like this society and I'll try to rebuild it. It's Saturday morning and a million and a half copies of Karadzic's magazine, Ogunyuk, have gone on sale. Now, a year ago, you wouldn't have any trouble buying a copy. Now, you have to get out early, get online and get it. Otherwise, they're all sold out, by, certainly by 10 o'clock. Uh, it's 
posible. In fact, the fellow behind me got the last copy. But Ogunyak isn't the only one playing by the new rules. We were heroic. We prepare article about oh, this, this memory society, about, yeah. yeah. And they publish a bigger article and sometimes stronger than we do. And what paper is this in? Uh, Komsomolska Pravda. Ah. Youth newspaper. This week, the communist youth newspaper has scooped Ogunyak by one day with an attack on an ultra-nationalist group called Memory, which is using openness to declare open season on Jews, rock musicians, and Karatich himself. But Glasnost does not mean anything goes. Karatich publishes an article by this reporter raising questions about Glasnost. And here is Dan Rasser on the most uh, serious place. Right next to it, a reply from an official Soviet spokesman. All right, well, you think Glasnost represents real fundamental change in Soviet yeah, life yeah, and in the yeah, system. Yeah. You called it a change in the moral atmosphere of yes, the country. Yes. Now, can you finish it? Let's pick up that point. Will it last? Yes, uh, it depends on us. If uh, we lose, it means we were not ready for this. I'll be a loser. You see, my, my idea will be a loser's idea. But I think now we have such a people which fight for this. A fight that Karatic is waging from well within the new Soviet establishment. He's been a member of the Communist Party for nearly half his 51 years. Glasnost has been very, very good to him. And, uh, having very in a society where cars are still luxury, Karadich now rides around in two, one from the magazine and another of his own just like it. And when Zina Karadich needs meat or fruit or vegetables, she doesn't bother with the poorly stocked state stores. She heads straight for Moscow's Central Market, an outpost of capitalism that provides better quality and quantity for a price. Today, she pays five rubles for a kilo of veal. That's about four dollars a pound. One merchant boasts that this is the most expensive market in Moscow. The Karatich boys still miss the Ukrainian city of Kiev, where the family lived until their father got the Ogunyak job. Now they spend their time at Moscow's secondary general education school number 30. On this day, 12-year-old Nikita is lucky. He's going on a field trip. Vitaly Jr., 16, is not so lucky. Tell me about what you dream, what you want to be. I dream at first to join the university when I end the school. Mm -hmm. And then I dream to be a good journalist. Ah, you want to be a journalist like your yes. father. I think that in our time that journalism is a very important profession. And I like this life. Well, I can't argue with you. I like it myself, you know. But Tully Sr. likes it too. But he's willing to put his career on the line for an idea whose time has come. He hopes. What's yeah. the single most important thing that people who watch this program should know about Glasnost, the change in the Soviet Union? The single most important thing. I want you to believe me, you see. I want my children to believe me. Sometimes even my sons told me. It's the real. I want to believe me. I want to believe because now you only believe and or not believe. And I play with my life. I play with it with all my life, with all my life chances. If we lose this, it means you'll be on the same places where you are. For me, it will be catastrophe from many points of view. But I don't want this. I don't want this catastrophe for my, for my country. This portion of the Soviet Union, Seven Days in May, is sponsored by Kellogg's Raisin Bran, with two scoops of plump, juicy raisins in every package. All my years in the raisin business, I could never figure out why Kellogg's put two scoops of raisins in their Raisin Bran. Why so many raisins? You know what I think? It's that second scoop gets you up a little earlier, gets you singing in the shower. It's Kellogg's. It's delicious. It's special. You're special. You deserve two scoops. Maybe we can go in that day and ask for a raise. No. Fiber Ridge Kellogg's Raisin Brand. Two scoops is a lot of raisins. Knowledge is the hope of the future. 
And at Merrill Lynch, our knowledge can help you break down financial boundaries. And our financial consultants can show you more ways to achieve your children's educational goals. Because at Merrill Lynch, we know the class of 2008 begins today. This is new Coronet Angel Soft Bath Tissue. We've asked some spokes angels to tell you what most impresses them about it. New two-layer Angel Soft Bath Tissue, in the inimitable words of those who have tried it, is Angel Soft Soft. These are Long John Silver's four unique sea salads. They're not your typical fast food salads. How can I tell? Well, see that shrimp, that seafood, those fresh vegetables, even that pasta? You notice how much seafood there is? I think the technical term is a lot. That's the difference. See, even though other places have salads, they're just not as interested in the principle of a lot like Long John Silver's is. Long John Silver's. Sea salads. Sounds good to me. Concert stage of front line in Gorbachev's battle for Glasnost. This year's revolutionary vanguard, rock musicians. Just look at these guys. When the Soviets talk about the decadent West, this is what they're talking about. These guys. This music, and the irony is, this concert is sponsored by the authorities. It's put on by the communists. It must be an example of that old Marxist maxim, if you can't beat them, join them. Or exploit them, or co-opt them. Here are the facts. The government is sponsoring more bands. The lyrics are becoming wilder, and for the first time, the authorities have let heavy metal out of the mill. This band's refrain, our music will be eternal. It's just that the whole situation in the country is now much more loose. And uh, musicians, they just uh, understand this and they you know, jump into the bandwagon of glassness. There's Gorbachev, there's Gorbachev. This one's the star. Like the Bolsheviks 70 years ago, Boris Gorbachev has emerged from the underground to be acclaimed by the masses. I try never to miss one of his concerts. His newest song is called Babushka, Grandma. It's about the people who watch over us, punish us when we're naughty. It's about grandma, it's about government. Now, anywhere in the Western world, rock stars lead a pretty soft life. But this is where Boris Prebenchikov lives. It's an old building in downtown Leningrad. Not very well kept, not very clean, really. The walls are peeling, it smells like a New York subway station. The only sign that somebody famous lives here is the writing on the wall. Graffiti left by his fans who come here as if they're coming to a shrine. Boris, we love you. Boris, we won't let you down. Right now, getting down isn't the problem. Boris Gorbenchikov lives on the top floor of a six-story walk-up. But artistically, he says, poverty is an asset. Nobody pays us, so we're free. And what the authorities do is come to Grabenchikov and ask him nicely for his underground tapes so they can make an official record. Why are the authorities doing that? 
They want to cash in. They receive so much money. But this is money the musicians don't see much of. Entire bands often get 16 bucks a performance, while the authorities make thousands from the music-starved masses. Sado-Marxism. So much leather, so few bikes. Music? Music? Oh, yeah. He's enjoying music. the music. When they go to a rock concert, do they still feel as if there's something forbidden about it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's still this feeling. Does that make it more exciting? Yeah. <laughs> but this is serious. Meet Algus Cospetes, a prominent architect who's designed a hospital, a school, and a rock band to get the message out. We want to help Gorbachev. We criticize the lazy bureaucracy. This is our protest. No! Algus just won first prize in Lithuania's annual Battle of the Band. One song called The Medal is about a leader whose only interest is to collect medals. It's about Brezhnev. And here is mass production, a new path, a five-year plan. Communism's cliches satirized more broadly in rock than they could be anywhere else. What rock musicians view as modest progress, others see as bourgeois counter-revolution, and the backlash has begun. A leading Soviet poet campaigning in the press has compared rock to that other import from the West, AIDS. Rock does to the soul what AIDS does to the body, he says, and it's spreading just as quickly. Soviet researchers just reported that hard rock causes rockomania, a disease characterized by memory loss and by that cardinal sin, low productivity. But the official view seems to be that it's still preferable to other addictions. Rebenchikov says he's still stunned by the new freedoms. Algis says rock musicians are doing as much as anyone to shake the system, that they're being taken seriously now, which means that they've won the first battle in their version of Star Wars. Just in case you're beginning to think, well, Moscow's not that much different from my hometown, get a load of this. Vending machine, they have them all over town. But they are different. The glass is in upside down. First, you press the glass down, some water comes up, and they say that cleans the glass. Here's the way it works. For about two cents, they will sell you a glass of mineral water. Whoop! <laughs> well, let me show it to you again. It takes a while to get used to this thing, right? This is the point. It's a little bit different the way it is at home. OK, again, this thing is supposed to work this way. You put your money in up here. You put your glass down. And you have your glass of mineral water. Trouble is, it sells the same glass to everybody. Everybody drinks from the same glass. If you've got a thirst for something harder, 
that's harder to get. That's because of Mikhail Gorbachev's two-year campaign against alcoholism. Liquor stores are open for only four hours on weekdays, so drinkers have to line up for their vodka. It costs more, too, nearly $15 for the cheapest bottle. Cut the camera. Yeah. The Soviets aren't exactly proud of this. No, he says that we've got to get a permission from the local police station. Americans trying to tape a liquor line are apt to get an argument. The campaign has reduced drinking. Crime and divorce are down. Life expectancy is up, the Soviets say. But there's so much moonshine being made that sugar and yeast are said to be in short supply. One artist's comment on all this. A jar of the homemade brew. The rubber glove inflated by fermenting spirits. The name of this work? Hello, Mr. Gorbachev. I saw mommy lying on the sofa. I asked him, Uncle Volodya, what's wrong with her? And he told me she was very ill. And told me to go to my room. So I went to my room. I saw drops in the bathroom. They were red drops. A rare look at a routine day inside a Moscow court. Uncle Volodya, Vladimir Kazantsov, faces a prison term for wounding his live-in girlfriend Olga with a knife. Olga's son, Misha, is one key witness. Kazantsov's chances of beating this charge are slim. He confessed during his police interrogation. He had no right to even see his defense attorney until after the investigation was finished. Defendants don't get read their rights in the Soviet Union. There is no Miranda warning. His defense lawyer, however, came up with this effective trial strategy. Call the defendant's mother to the stand to plead for mercy. Let him go free. As far as the treatment for alcoholism is concerned, if I could put it this way, I'll do everything I can. Kazantsov was sentenced to an alcohol rehab program, but his attorney still complained he did not have a proper defense. Lawyers here are demanding the right to represent their clients from the moment of detention, just like in the United States. The nation whose legal system conjures visions of Siberia is considering its own form of Miranda. Most of our images of Soviet justice surround harsh, cruel sentences, the death penalty perhaps, a system based not on law, but more on the arbitrary use of power. Is that image accurate? Most Soviets would say no, but at the same time, it is the Soviets themselves who are debating whether their system could be made more fair. Maybe you remember that innocent people have been beaten and, because of the methods used on them, had to confess to crimes they hadn't committed. One of the crusaders for Soviet legal reform is attorney and journalist Arkady Voxberg. I know and have written about prosecutors who are simply the domesticated pets of their local chiefs. They have forgotten their professional duty, carried out any order given to them. This new atmosphere in which crooked prosecutors can be exposed changed the life of this man, Sasha Kalugin, a free-spirited Russian artist who has spent much of his adult life dodging the militia. Because of Sasha's looks and his stuttering problem, he's often been rounded up by the militia during major international events in Moscow. Last year, during the Goodwill Games, Sasha once again was arrested and held in Moscow's psychiatric ward number 15, the charge resisting the authorities. I've had problems for a long time with the police and with authorities in general. Sasha had last been rounded up in 1983. He stayed in the psychiatric ward then a full year with no explanations, no criminal charges filed. Every once in a while they think they need to hide you. Well, what else could it have been? I've been thinking, why? Last year's arrest was different. After three months, Sasha's wife, Tamara, received a letter from the investigator admitting the state could not prove the charge, and Sasha was set free. That had never happened before. To Sasha Kalugin, legal reform literally means he is no longer afraid of the militia. His confidence was put to the test during our taping, when the militia stopped to ask for our documents, and then began taking down Sasha's name. No, no, we want to, what have we done wrong? 
What have we done wrong? The militia man explained they only stopped to see who was filming. What kind of a company? No problem. No problem. This man's not in trouble. No problem. You see, I am an optimist by nature. My wife is the pessimist. For me, I don't know. I am still cautious and mistrusting of the authorities. I really don't know what to think now. I just have this great feeling of mistrust. Changes in the legal system here have opposition. There are conservatives who don't see the American way as anything the Soviets should admire. To them, defendants' rights is a code phrase that allows too many criminals to walk free. They don't see the justice in that. This is courtroom number 36 in a district court in Moscow. They call it the People's Court. Behind me, seven defendants, all of them juvenile, are about to be sentenced for a variety of charges, including robbery and assault. One of the juveniles is acquitted. The rest, two young women and four young men, are sentenced to a labor camp. The sentence for all the crimes committed should be three years at a re-educational minimum security labor camp with no confiscation of property. Legal reform will not change the Soviet concept of justice. In America, we believe in the certainty of rights. The Soviets believe in the certainty of punishment. Freedom. It's becoming what you want to be. Doing what you want to do. Involving yourself in what you value most. Merrill Lynch can help you achieve that freedom. We believe the client always comes first. So we can help you find the best choices from our world of opportunities. Because at Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. One of the beautiful things about eating cheese is all the calcium it gives you. Cheese, glorious cheese. It's one of nature's most concentrated sources of calcium. What else is so wonderful? Real cheese is always in style. It's cheese, marvelous cheese. Glorious cheese. Well, I knew trying it didn't cause cavities, but help fight them? No, I didn't know that. It's true. Chewing Trident after sugary snacks reduces the acids on your teeth that can cause cavities. It couldn't happen to a better gum. Trident, good to chew and fights cavities, too. You, you were always my favorite. And now you've never, never been better. Because only sugar-free certs has NutraSweet. And it's never been better. Sugar-free certs, now with NutraSweet. It's a question of taste. If you had your pick of two cereals, both with 100% nutrition, would you pick the one with just one kind of flake? Or Kellogg's Just Right with three different kinds of flakes, plus hearty rolled oats, plump raisins, sweet juicy dates, and crisp crunchy nuts? You're not alone. Three out of four people pick Just Right over every other high vitamin cereal. There was no question of nutrition. It was simply a question of taste. Kellogg's Just Right with fruit or whole grain. In the past 10 years or so, some 200,000 Russian citizens have immigrated to America hoping to find a better way of life. Last January, about 50 of those immigrants came back to the Soviet Union saying they were disillusioned with life in America and just wanted to be back in the USSR. This is the story of two of those returnees, Anatoly and Olga Gross. Come on in. Don't be afraid. A lot of people in this apartment. <laughs> You know, I'm not political man, I'm not, you know, I'm just a musician, that's all. There, there were no political reasons why you no, left the Soviet Union? No, no, at all. You know, I never touched political problems here, and they never touched me, that's all. As songwriters, Tolly and Olga Gross lived a very good life in the USSR. They had two cars, an art collection, and they made more money than a Soviet general. They left Russia eight years ago because Olga's father, who was living in New York, 
told them they could do even better in the States. We called each other very often, and he told Tolly that it's, it would be very easy uh, to make a career over there. He promised a recording deal, so we believed. Record producer Mikey Harris, now with CBS, befriended Olga and Tolly Gross. His father-in-law promised him a record deal. You better believe that he had contacts. And in fact? <laughs> no. He was a lonely old man who was dying. After 40 million copies of my records, what you are so here, I came in America and I got to drive a cab. You got? I got to drive a cab. He had written a song called How Are You America? I heard that, thought it would make a great single, and uh, wheeled and dealed my way through the studio time. You thought that song could have been a hit? Yes, it did. Still do. From Russia, totally. Here he is. You were on local television in New York? Yes. Yeah. They even so said, on. this is New American Idol. Mickey Jagger move over. over. And I remember I watched it yeah, and they Mickey cried. Over, they said. I thought we were very close. They said, Mick Jagger, move over? Yes. Yeah. Here comes Tolly. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we were going into session the day the Korean airliner was shot down. By the Soviet Union? Yes. And circumstance really got involved. So here you're recording a Russian singer. As they're shooting down an airliner. <laughs> that would seem to make it a tough sell. Mm. In one place, Tolly was a star, in Brooklyn's Brighton Beach neighborhood, home to 50,000 Russian immigrants. I went, you know, to play in Russian nightclubs. So that the only people who heard your music were other Russians. You couldn't cross over that wall to the American music market. We just left the fight. We didn't want to fight anymore. Yes. My father died in America. The what? My father died in America. Mm -hmm. We were alone over there without any member of the family. Do you think they ever became Americanized? Realistically, probably the only one that did was their son, Philip. And, woo, that's going to be a transition and a half. And now you're only, only, only. For Philip, I feel that I'm nervous about him. He's a very complicated boy because he was born here, I brought him over there when he was five, and now I brought him back. Mm -hmm. He's a little bit broken. Like in America, right? Mm -hmm. You could go to a store and buy anything you want. Mm -hmm. And here, like, you have, to, you have to look around the whole Moscow to get, you know, to get something, one thing. They have only one thing, like, um, like oranges. They have, like, um, five, like, 10 or 15 brands there. Lots of companies. They have only one company for each thing. And you take what they have, and that's it. Yeah. You don't have no choice. You have it. You have to take it right away before they... My mother and my sister, they can't understand. He's too independent for them sometimes. He doesn't feel at home yet. You're absolutely certain, in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, that as a Jew, you simply cannot stay and work in this country? No, I cannot. Absolutely. Sure. As a Jew, did you consider leaving the country? Never. I want to make it clear. As soon as I get exit visa next morning, I will go. <laughs> no doubt about it. I was born to play piano, and I like to play piano, and when people gave me opportunity to play, I play. But I cannot uh, forget what's happened with me for eight years, all bitter, bad things. Vladimir Felsman is one of about 11,000 refugees people who have asked for exit visas and been refused. What happened? 
In a two hours after I make uh, clear my desire to leave the country, one friend, one of my friend who used to work in TV and radio station Oscar, called me and asked me, Volodya, what's happened? What's wrong with you? We just got a call from Central Committee and people said, never play again his music. What's happened? He does most of his playing now in the cramped Moscow apartment he shares with his wife Anna and their four-year-old son. The Soviet authorities assign him concerts around the country. It's a long way from Carnegie Hall. Like the vast majority of refuseniks, Vladimir Felsman is Jewish. But he says it is artistic, not religious freedom that he seeks in the West. My only crime was, and still is, that I simply want to decide myself when, what, and where to, to play. It is nothing against Soviet countries, Soviet system, or just high, uh, high officials. But Soviets think that if you ask for exit visa, you are kind of betrayer as a motherland. It is very stupid. It is simply stupid. David Schreier is a writer and a medical doctor. His wife Milo, an English teacher. They applied for exit visas the same year Vladimir Felsman did, and like him, were turned down again and again. Getting into the position of a refusenik, uh, you become an, an outlaw. You no longer have your former position, you no longer have your former job, uh, because automatically you are forced to leave uh, your job in, in case you, you have to apply so the document. Excuse me, you're placed in a kind of limbo. Limbo, yes. Limbo. Limbo. Yes. Limbo. 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 When we met the Shriers, eight long and bitter years were coming to an end. Finally, their visas had been granted. This is Bill Freeman. How do you do? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Please welcome. It was time to say goodbye to old friends. May I kiss you too today? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please, you're welcome. Do you find yourself thinking, well, maybe we should stay? Maybe things are going to change now? Oh, no. The decision has been made eight years ago, and uh, now that's our purpose and the, the only dream we have. We've done away with everything in this country. We no longer love it. These are my books in 45 languages. Anatoly Ribakov is also Jewish and a writer, but the only place he's going is to the top of the bestseller list. You were telling me about this, uh, what, what was happening here. You were showing me this manuscript. This At 76, Rybakov is coming out with his 11th novel this year, a novel he wrote 20 years ago. But this was draft one, huh? Yeah. Children of the Arbat is a literary bombshell, the first Soviet work to deal, frankly, with the mass arrest and deportations of the Stalin era, a time when Rybakov himself spent three years in Siberian exile. The book was promised to the public twice before and suppressed. My novel is 20 years old. And I have had many offers to have it published in the West. But I didn't give it to the West. Because this novel is needed by my people is needed by my country and it must be published here. And as an artist, that is all that is important to me. That way, I can tell my people the truth about themselves and their history. Anatoly Rybakov is making a good living because of his talent. He is making literary history because of his patience. I'm a Russian writer. So it's impossible for me to give a refusenik permission to leave. Understand, I can't do it. If I could, I would give them permission to go. Soon after our visit, David and Mila and Max Schreier left the Soviet Union for an uncertain new life in the West. They have no plans to return.
Vladimir Filtzman is hopeful that soon he too will be free to go. And maybe someday, someday, free to come back. If someday they will change a little bit their minds and will make this country more open, I will be back, back here and play in Moscow for my public with great pleasure. No doubt about it. are breaking the boundaries of age as never before. And at Merrill Lynch, our expertise in retirement planning can help you get more out of life. And our financial consultants can show you more ways to help assure your future. Because at Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. Try a double fudge bar. Oh, I can't eat chocolate. I can't. So it looks so rich. I can't. So creamy. I can't. So sinful. I can't. I can't. I really can't. It's from Weight Watchers. Oh, yes, I can. Weight Watchers double fudge bars. So chocolatey, so smooth. And it's from Weight Watchers. So it says, yes, I can. Folks, it's official. The big mouth is now the fresh mouth. Thanks to new super strength Paladin. Now with a minty mouthwash ingredient, so it freshens dentures as it cleans them. Try new Paladin Green. It freshens as it cleans. Ah. Are you still collecting the same old stuff? We'll start something new with stamps. Especially now with our new American Wildlife Issue. 50 beautifully detailed animal, bird, reptile, and insect stamps. Each commemorating America's natural wildlife heritage. Now at your post office. And remember, unlike some things, once you collect stamps, you can enjoy their beauty forever. MasterCard salutes the historic flight of Voyager. Back on Earth, pilots Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager are on the move, and they've never needed MasterCard more. They fly with it, drive with it, even guarantee hotel reservations with it, and of course, celebrate. Cheers. To the possibilities. With MasterCard. For people who go the distance, MasterCard, master the possibilities. This CBS News special will continue. On the CBS Summer Playhouse, Valerie Perrine and Brenda Vaccaro have designs on clothes and laughs. We make dresses for women who dare to eat lunch. <laughs> Changing patterns, Friday. You love it when they scheme. I am selling sex. You feel the pain when they lose. Don't ask me to be a good sport. Dallas, still the best. Then on hard copy. You're not going to give me one more chance. You gave it a shot, kid. Paula's fight to save her career turns into a struggle to save her life. Friday. This is CBS. Try caffeine-free Diet Coke. Same great taste as Diet Coke without the caffeine. Just for the taste of me, Diet Coke. This is an eyewitness news break brought to you by J.C. Penney. Hello, I'm Deborah Giannolis. Coming up on the late news, working into the wee hours is the only way the Jacksonville landing will make it by tomorrow's noon opening. We'll take you there tonight. A pit bull attack in Jacksonville is bringing the national concern over the often vicious dogs home. And the talk show circuit has a new subject from the PTL scandal. Join us for Eyewitness News at 11. Through Saturday only at JCPenney, take an extra 25% off the already reduced prices of all men's red ticketed merchandise at all four stores. JCPenney! Jacksonville celebrates Thursday night at 8. This is Volgograd, the city on the Volga River, but it used to be Stalingrad back during World War II. The city of steel, named after the man of steel. And they still make steel here. The steel worker has always been a heroic figure in Soviet labor. In America these days, steel is a troubled industry. We thought we'd see how it was doing here. And to find out, we met two people, Yuri and Galya Shetka. 
Each year, it gets harder and harder to work. Not so much physically, but in my moral relationship with work. It's gotten harder for me to make my peace with all the shortages. It's the same with our supplies. We don't get enough or they are no good. It's the same all over the Soviet Union. Seven forty-five. After changing clothes, the workday begins with a roll call. The man in charge talks about the jobs to be done today and asks for questions. Hill Street Blues with a difference. Finally, they brought the scrap that we needed. But that's only half the problem. We still have to unload it from the train. Let's not waste any time. And let's not make any alloys that haven't been ordered. Be careful with the pouring ladles. You've only got two of them working now, and you won't have any left if they break. Okay, that's it. Yuri and Galia both work here. He's a team leader at the last furnace down this road. It's a good job and pays almost $800 a month. She drives one of these cranes over my head and earns about $350. That makes them one of the best paid couples in the Volgograd area, probably. They work eight hours a day, five days a week. They and their son, Dennis, have a three-room apartment, living room, bedroom, kitchen, rent about $20 a month. This is our sitting room. Our son sleeps on the couch. This is my kitchen, my second working place. This is where I do breakfast, lunch and dinner for my family. We'd better ask them if they like it. But in here, Everything is done the way I like it. Sunday is a day off, a chance to go down to the market where farmers sell goods from private plots, and nowadays goods straight off collective farms. You can see what's on the shelves, what you might have for Sunday dinner. Seven rubles per chicken. Crowds in this market today. That's because there are no shortages here. Food is more expensive. What might cost two rubles in a government store if there were any would cost, say, three rubles here if it were being sold by a collective farm. Maybe four if it had come off a private plot. People are willing to pay that because the food is available and fresh and good. One other note. About two years ago, I remember arguing long and hard to film in a market like this in Moscow. This time, we were invited straight in. Our Moscow escort did object when we photographed a beggar. Other reactions were mixed. Look at the price of these. Disgusting. <laughs> Sometimes I just can't face all the sloppiness and the negligence. I talk with the guys and with our chief. We all agree to keep trying harder. We are gonna work, work, work. But then somebody does something wrong. Something's not ready. The alloy doesn't come out right or something. We talk to the boss again, to the party officials. They promised to make changes. Well, they've begun, but it's not enough. You are talking about perestroika, about reconstruction? Oh, there has been some, but not the sort of steps that we would like. You would be for uh, more rewards for, for people who do well and uh, uh, some way of, of getting rid of people who don't work? 
I absolutely agree with that. If I were running things at work, I would have taken those kinds of measures a long time ago. Take my brigade, for example. We worked as we should for a month. We filled all the orders. Nothing broke down. But then we discovered we had been given bad quality bricks because one of them exploded inside the furnace. So we lost time doing the repairs and we are the ones who suffered for it. That's why they walked about on melting scrap to repair the bricks. We saw no safety manuals here. I think if everybody fulfilled their responsibilities at work conscientiously, if the bosses demanded that of them, then everything would be much, much better. But right now, things aren't better. There are guilty people. The plan isn't fulfilled, but we are the ones who suffer. That's still the kind of system we have. are looking for something long buried, their past. Men and women who made a difference in politics, science, the arts, heroes of war and peace. This is Moscow's Novodevichy Cemetery. For the past 10 years, the public was not allowed to see what is in here. The cemetery was closed for repairs, they said. Now it's open again, and as you can see, the Russians are coming. They're coming from everywhere to search for the familiar names. A simple marker for Anton Chekhov. And flowers for a man who died in 1852, but whose novel, Dead Souls, earned him immortality. Nikolai Gogol. For some, the memories are as fresh as the flowers. But there are mysteries as well as memories here. Nadezhda Alalujeva, Stalin's wife. She is thought to have killed herself, but most of these people don't know that. And who could forget that face? Nikita Khrushchev. He tried to reform the Soviet system in his day. It cost him his job and his place in official Soviet history books. He is buried here instead of at the Kremlin wall with all the other Soviet leaders. Are you surprised that he's not in the Kremlin? Maybe that's what he wanted. I don't know. You're not surprised. That's a little bit one of those questions. But if the Soviets can rewrite history, they can't actually change it. This woman's sister and brother-in-law were purged by Stalin and rehabilitated by Khrushchev. All we should do is thank him. History will prove it. There is no present without the past. We have to have a new. We invited Jonathan Sanders, one of two CBS News consultants on Soviet matters, to talk about change in this place where the present meets the past. Despite the new openness, his fellow expert, Dmitry Symes, a former citizen of the Soviet Union, was denied a visa. We asked Sanders about resistance to the new reforms. The parameters opening up have made many people very unhappy. When you begin to drain a swamp, you're bound to find a lot of reptiles. And Gorbachev and the progressives are finding those reptiles, are finding the enemies of change, are finding the people who don't like the more westernized, more open attitudes, and they're encountering great problems and beginning to get this restructuring and this glossnos and this acceleration and this democratization of Soviet society going again. This portion of the Soviet Union, Seven Days in May, was sponsored by Merrill Lynch. At Merrill Lynch, we believe your world should know no boundaries. Knowledge is the hope of the future. 
And at Merrill Lynch, our knowledge can help you break down financial boundaries. And our financial consultants can show you more ways to achieve your children's educational goals. Because at Merrill Lynch, we know the class of 2008 begins today. Enjoying that crispy cereal, Lewis? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Side corn, side rice, sure makes it crispy. But the corn's crispier. Why, once I ate a bowl in Dugan's Apple Grove, the crunch from the corn side shook the tree so that now, come picking time, the Dugans don't need ladders just to crunch the corn side of Crispix. Grandpa, last time the rice side was crispier. Rice side? Well, you're thinking of the kid over in Milford that... Kellogg's Crispix is crispy. Times two. It all started 68 years ago. What followed were the most extraordinary driving machines of their day. But none more extraordinary than this. The 168 horsepower BMW 325i. The latest expression of our seven decade passion for driving. Get your spaghetti ready. ready for a new ragu thick and hearty spaghetti sauce. Our thickest, heartiest sauce ever. Made with lots of plump, juicy tomatoes. Special seasonings and spices for a zesty, full-body tomato taste. Now your spaghetti's ready. New ragu thick and hearty. Our thickest, heartiest sauce ever. For decades, the superpowers have eyed each other across the Iron Curtain with deep suspicion. Seven days in the Soviet Union are not enough to strip reporters of their skepticism about Soviet intentions. Some of the Soviets interviewed in our broadcast may not be what they seem. We cannot know yet whether glasnost or perestroika are merely tremors in Soviet society or something closer to an earthquake. The socialist state clearly has run out of economic miracles, if indeed it ever had any. Its people, stripped of incentives, are being outperformed by the economic powerhouses of Western Europe, Japan, and the United States. For the Soviet leadership, change is vital. But change here is always unpredictable. This is, after all, a deeply conservative society. We cannot yet know whether this exciting time represents opportunity or danger for the West. For seven days in May, it was for us an important opportunity to observe this nation when a superpower stirs, the world holds its breath. For CBS News, Dan Rather in Red Square, Moscow. Good night. This is CBS. Hello, everybody. In the news tonight, working all night for downtown's big day. And a pit bull attack puts a Northside child in the hospital. Eyewitness News is next.